Well, uh, I think we're about ready to get started, everyone. So uh, the earlier we get started, the earlier we can get done. Is is uh is Jay coming back today? What do you what do you say? Seventy six days or something this year? He said most of his guys, you know, we're doing double duty other places too. He said a lot of his guys filled in other places too, so they've had big fire seasons. as long as it's a ways away from here it's a good thing and it's good i mean it's good for those workers too they get great experience and good money and an extra pay too doesn't extra salary too that doesn't hurt Yeah, I mean, spent and those federal cuts and it's been a tough, tough fall for him. It's been a tough fall for him. Missed West River deer season. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Hunter Roberts. I'm a policy advisor for Governor Dugard. I work in agriculture, game fish and parks, transportation, and energy issues for the governor, um, amongst other various things. I'm also a liaison for the governor to uh, Commissioner Ryan Bruner, our commissioner of school and public lands, who was a moderator yesterday. So very tough job keeping track of Ryan and making sure he's working. No, it's not at all. Ryan, commissioner Bruner is a great person to work with. and. Um, very, very on the ground meeting with his people, which is great. Um, looking at the audience today, it looks like we have just as many people as yesterday. So we must all be in agreement that we had a great successful panel yesterday, great speakers, um, very cordial environment, but also talked about the real issues that are affecting um, agency culture and uh, wildland fire and things like that. It's definitely a uh, something that is great about the West is how we can get together and um, create solutions on some issues and still fight on other issues. But at the end of the day, we can all have a cocktail afterwards and discuss it with a smile on our face. So um, today we have um, several other or two more good panels. Um, we're going to start with the, the round table of active management and innovative markets. Um, we're gonna continue that kind of theme of federal government, state government, maybe local government representation and private um, representation. And then after that, we're gonna um, talk about strengthening collaboration and collaborative processes. Um, excited to see that panel. I know uh, they're gonna bring to light a lot of success stories that we've had in, in the Black Hills in South Dakota working with our federal partners to, to overcome solutions. So with that, I'll turn it over to the first panel. Thank you.
All right. Good morning, everyone. All right. Lively. Okay. Uh, my name is Kelsey Delaney. I work as the policy director for the Council of Western State Foresters. We're based in Denver, Colorado. Uh, just a little bit about the Council Western State Foresters. We're a nonprofit membership organization that is comprised of the 17 Western State Foresters and six Pacific Island Foresters. So Greg Jostin, South Dakota State Forester, is a member of our organization. We also have a very strong partnership, we being Council Western State Foresters, have a very strong partnership with our Western Forest Service leadership. Uh, that's known as the Western Forestry Leadership Coalition. So again, both Greg as well as Region 2 for the Forest Service Regional Forester, Brian Fairby, they're members of that coalition. As Hunter mentioned, this first panel this morning is Active Management in Innovative Markets. I'm gonna be the moderator of this panel. And as Hunter also mentioned, we heard a lot about both um, these themes yesterday. And so I really see our panel this morning continuing uh, and building on those, uh, those themes and, and further exploring them. The overall goal of this panel is to examine the Black Hills use of forest and rangeland management and how innovative markets can play a role in facilitating responsible management practices. Further, we'll take a look at how the Black Hills has utilized innovative markets um, to help achieve and work towards achieving multiple management objectives. Each of the speakers uh, are going to provide very brief opening remarks and then very similar to yesterday, we're going to go into that open dialogue. So please be brainstorming questions to ask our, our speakers this morning. And with that, I, I'm going to turn to our speakers. We've got three uh, panelists today. You'll be hearing from David Olilla, a sheet field specialist from South Dakota State University Extension. You'll be hearing from Jeff Parrott, Vice President, Wheeler Lumber. And then Steve Kozel, District Ranger, Bear Lodge Ranger District, Black Hills National Forest. And with that, I'll turn to David. Thank you, Kelsey, and again, uh, thank you to the Western Governors Association and the, the organizers within the state of South Dakota for having me. It's an honor and a privilege to be part of this discussion. Um, I'm a fifth generation rancher east of Newell, South Dakota on what we call the jumbo. Hard to make a living there, so I have a day job. And I was a ag education teacher for 25 years and uh, good or bad, Ryan Bruner was one of my students out of that. So those of you that need some dirt, I got it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, uh, you're going to see the undertones of my comments having to do with education. And obviously extension is just that adult form of that in a lot of cases. And, and as, as an ag teacher, in Western South Dakota, you needed to uh, identify your content area based on the local needs of, of the agriculturalists in your community. And obviously in Newell, you in Harding counties and in Lawrence and Mead, uh, you're looking at a lot of agriculture. And that being the case, then what does that agriculture look like? Timber and rangeland, farming industries. And so I obviously put a lot of emphasis in that. And, and you know, and the truth be told, and the, most of us know this in agriculture and, and even in, in the timber industry, a lot of your numbers of people are dwindling and they're just operating greater acres or larger industries with fewer people. And that's the case in, in agriculture for sure. So I always ask a lot of my students, how many of you are gonna be farmers and ranchers? And, and out of a your class of 20, I might get three or four. And so I'd say, well, what the hell are the rest of you going to do? And what are you doing in this class? You know, this is for farmers and ranchers. And they go on. But <laughs> my point for them was, uh, and especially uh, some of those tones were talked about yesterday, they 
can be the voice for us as they go out into other occupations, much of which serve us in the natural resource industry. And so it was, it was always a matter of pride for me to see the folks like the Ryan Bruners and a number of others that became those advocates for us and we need them. And so uh, Mike touched on some of that yesterday. We have a message of, and a story that we need to get out there that's not happening too. And, and again, with summarizing some of yesterday's uh, comments as well, um, you know, we're a red and blue country. And, you know, those folks in the urban areas look at us out on the prairies, not so much romantically like they used to, and, you know, cowboys, um, but they look at us as capitalists and industrialists who have all the wealth and power and money. And we certainly know different, but they don't see it that way. So we have a story that we need to express if we want them to buy into what we're trying to sell them as far as what good we are doing these public lands. And that's huge. That message has got to resonate. And we know that. We've seen that. We've seen the attacks to the use and multiple use of public lands. Uh, me being a sheep herder um, and our industry continues to shrink. And why is that? Because of the pressure of taking those animals off public land. And they have a purpose and a need there, but apparently we're not selling it very well. And, and we're getting pushed off. And maybe, you know, like everything, there's always people that abuse those uh, opportunities. And we need to do a better job with that. Uh, so some of my discussion will have to do with the paradigm shift. And again, that got brought up yesterday as well, cultural shifts and paradigm shifts. And so I'll give you this analogy. You know, the moldboard plow invented in the early 1800s did a heck of a job with expanding and improving our ability to be producers of food. And within the next 20 years, the only place you're going to find that plow is in a museum. So while it served its purpose at that time, it's no longer needed. And we found new and better technology that's more sustainable. And the huge thing is it's resilient. We, and that's, that's what I love about uh, being in, in extension and providing some of those ideas, is we can do better with less. Um, the efficiencies and challenges of, of being profitable drive us that way. But one of the uh, things that we can do is by going into those no-till systems, and system is a key word certainly in the, the use and, and management of the Black Hills and, and developing some of those innovative markets, is we have to look at the big, big picture. And um, that happened in... Um, getting rid of the plow. Um, and it's interestingly enough, those adopters and, and I forget who touched on them, I think it was Alan yesterday, uh, some of those folks um, up in that Burley County of North Dakota are doing some huge things uh, using livestock to take the place and, and emulate some of those things that even a plow would serve. And it's interesting as well that uh, those people that are changing or doing, conducting that paradigm shift to in agriculture or farming are using the practices and principles that we know in natural resource management in dealing with range and grass. And that's in, in, on my own place, I've become a better farmer, not that I was ever a very good one, uh, because it always felt wrong uh, stirring that soil. And now that I haven't done that in the last 15 years, and I've had to use range management principles and systems approach to uh, growing crops, it's, uh, I'm, I'm much more productive because we're using a system approach to that. And we're, we're taking into consideration what the uh, resource is offering us in that soil. It's a living, breathing organism, certainly in the rangelands and the forest too. And it provides us a, a number of things indirectly that uh, besides food, clean air and clean water. 
And if there's anything that we need to, and certainly an extension and, and in our government agencies need to uh, work on and, and focus on is what do we expect the public lands to look like and how will they be used a hundred years from now? Because I, I really believe it's going to be different. The plow served its purpose 200 years ago, no longer needed now. What are we doing now that won't be necessary or we find better technology to do the same thing with more efficiently? And what are some of those demands and needs that our nation will need 100 years from now that will be demanded of our public lands? And I, I'll go back to clean air and water. You know, those are always gonna be those things that certainly our urban cousins are going to be pushing us on. And by golly, we can do it with what we have for management practices and technology. We can do that. We can serve our nation and continue to make it strong. Our best national security is our ability to produce food in our industry. And as long as we can have those understandings, I think that we've got a great opportunity to look at that big picture and set ourselves up to be a prosperous, healthy nation with healthy rangeland and forest resources. And so as we get along, um, I'd be happy to take questions about some of those ideas later. Thank you, Dave. Jeff. Good morning. I'll try not to get too close to this. I tend to talk a little loud at times. Um, Thank you for inviting me. I want to thank the governor and WGA for having us here. Um, as Kelsey said, I work for Wheeler Lumber. Uh, I wanted to start out, just give a little, uh, tell you who we are. Uh, a lot of people that are in the hills here know we run a, a wood treating plant in Whitewood, but that's just a small part of our company. And uh, part of what I'm going to talk today is about innovation and change and adapting to uh, market conditions. Uh, Wheeler has been around since 1892. So, um, you know, we were, we were around when the first sale case study was done here in the Black Hills. Uh, you know, we, we started in Des Moines, Iowa, moved into Minnesota. So we were heavily involved in logging with horses and oxen back in the 1920s. At one time, Minnesota was the largest uh, timber market in the, in the world. Uh, so we're very familiar with logging and uh, forest management we're now uh, moving into our fourth generation of ownership. We're privately owned. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to work with the second and third generations of, of the company. And uh, we've definitely seen a lot of change um, over 125 years. Um, we've been here in the Black Hills since 1959. Uh, we uh, opened a treating plant, which was primarily to service the railroad with cross ties. Um, over the years, we've changed considerably uh, due to uh, products mix off the forest and market conditions, just like um, a lot of our current businesses here in the Black Hills. I wanted to start out by uh, our, our talk today was about innovation and active management. Uh, just give a, a definition of innovation. Often viewed as the application of better solutions that meet new requirements unarticulated needs or existent, existing market needs. This is accomplished through more effective products, processes, services, or technologies. In an organization, innovation is linked to positive changes in efficiency, productivity, quality, competitiveness, and market share. Uh, there's many def different definitions of innovation. That's one I chose that I, uh, I liked. Uh, in the forest products industry, innovation is critical. Competition is one of the drivers of innovation. As part of our business models, we're accustomed to it. We continually strive to be faster, better, and more efficient in what we do whether it's to develop new markets, change existing ones, change our products, it's ingrained in us. It's not easy, but those who fail to innovate do not survive. Here in the Black Hills, we're fortunate that we have a, 
a very diverse forest products industry that's evolved over the last hundred years. Uh, we uh, directly employ 1,400 people here in the Black Hills and contribute $120 million into the local economy. We manufacture a wide variety of products. Hopefully there's, I guess I don't have my slides up there, but uh, I do have a few slides that, that list our companies and, and what we produce. Uh, we do produce a multitude of products here in the hills from uh, lumber to pallets, fence posts, particle board, and you know, too numerous to describe here. Uh, we have a few listed on my slide up there. Uh, but we, we have companies that utilize the whole tree uh, in one way, shape, or form. And we're all interrelated because we are in this geographical range of 90 to 100 miles within each other. Uh, we do a lot of business amongst each other. Uh, for example, uh, Rushmore Forest Products, they, they sell lumber to forest products distributors in Rapid City, and they sell the byproducts to Dakota Panel. Uh, they all rely on one another. If you look you know, at the list of companies up there, um, every company deals with at least two or three of those other companies in one way, shape, or form. So if something happens to one company, it affects two to three to four other companies. Uh, you know, if if uh, Rushmore can't get the saw logs they need, uh, their production goes down, it affects two other companies because they can't get the products they need. Uh, and the list goes on. There's lots of examples of that. We can, you know, if anybody has any questions about that, we could talk about that later. But part of this is that we need, it's economy of scale. And we need companies that are large enough to be able to move in different directions and make the investments needed when those market conditions change, whether it's the mix of forest products coming off the, the national forest or market conditions, or uh, for example, uh, over the years we've had uh, outlets for chips and, and byproducts and those outlets went away. What do we do with that product now? Those sorts of issues that we have to overcome. In government, innovation is a little tougher. Uh, government is, is nonprofit. Their motivation doesn't come from profit. So they have to drive this culture of innovation within their own organization. And that was talked about a little bit yesterday afternoon and in, in the historical cultures of, of the Forest Service and where do we go with that? What's our identity? How do we drive change, efficiencies, and uh, innovation? Uh, I do want to compliment the Forest Service for having uh, Christine Dahl and Alan Rowley and Jackie Buchanan here because you people are in positions within the Forest Service to make those types of policy changes and improve the efficiencies and processes. That's why it's important that we, we all work together for common ground. We do have common ground and, and we consider, industry considers our relationship with the Forest Service a partnership and, and it's essential for us to keep discussing uh, issues and ways to uh, make our businesses mutually benefit from what's coming off the forest. Over the last hundred years, our industry has adapted to changing forest plans and changing markets. Uh, we went through a decreased timber sale program here in the Black Hills and, and we lost some mills. Some of them uh, probably would have died with or without that. Uh, but others have survived because we've adapted. We're constantly striving to try to better utilize the mix of products coming off the forest. You know, we're in, constantly investing and incorporating new and improved technology to, to utilize that, uh, creating new markets and striving to use uh, more biomass off the forest. We've had initiatives, research, and grant money, um, to try to better utilize small roundwood and biomass off the forest. Uh, here locally, none of those projects have succeeded to date uh, due to numerous reasons. So the answer is to take biomass uh, and create 
fuel or energy and, and new types of products, we're, we're a long ways from finding answers to those sorts of questions. Uh, we need to look at the current industry we have here today and, and find solutions to those problems with the industry we have here today. And we can't do that without a strong timber program. What can we take to other communities uh, with what we learned here in the Black Hills? I'd say the number one priority uh, that any forest sector needs is a predictable, stable timber sale program. Mills have closed here due to lack of logs. And I can tell you, I, I travel around the region as uh, I talk to different mills and, and West Coast, same thing, that none of those mills will tell you they have enough logs to meet the demand of their consumers. We have to work together to continually manage our active, actively manage our public lands to create the type of forest that we want to see in the future. Just as Dave said, you know, what's what we want our forest to look like 100 years from now. Um, you know, the uh, Forest Service has been mandated to utilize uh, the forest in, uh, for multiple use. Uh, we have multi here in the hills, we do have multiple use and a lot of users of the forest. And, and I know it's not easy, but we have to find ways to achieve uh, a balance in the users of the forest and create a healthy forest. And, and the Forest Service, we depend on you for a stable timber supply. And I know you depend on us to helping you manage the forest and get to the to, uh, desired condition of what that forest should be. And so we need to work together to do that. And uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, Jeff. Steve. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, and I also would like to express my thanks to the Western Governors Association, State of South Dakota, and Governor Dugard for inviting me here today. Um, it's a privilege to sit up here with two great individuals and a whole, um, whole host of, of folks here in the room that have a lot of knowledge um, about forest management and uh, rangeland management um, across the Western US. Um, active management uh, in the Black Hills started back in, in 1899, yes with case one, uh, as mentioned by uh, uh, Governor Dugard. So there's a long storied history of, of managing this forest um, in this area. Today, um, our active management focuses on restoring and uh, uh, creating resilient conditions in, in our forest, reducing threats from wildland fire, uh, reducing hazardous fuels, and creating habitats for important wildlife species and clean water. You know, with that kind of objectives, um, most of our work here in the last several years has concentrated around the mountain pine beetle epidemic, which driven quite a bit of our work. Um, this past year, the forest accomplished over 57,000 acres of fuel reduction, um, 6,200 acres of thinning of small diameter trees and 22,000 acres of commercial timber harvest, which resulted in products to um, the uh, timber industry of um, 208,000 cubic feet of, uh, of, of material. And uh, about that, uh, about 7,000 of that was, was smaller diameter post and pole type of material. So if you're, if you're a board feet person, just divide those numbers by half. And so it's about 100 million board feet of uh, saw timber and about three and a half million board feet of, of small, smaller um, diameter material. So uh, that, that work um, has been pretty consistent for the last several years. As I mentioned, um, much of our work is, is centered around creating resilient force, um, working very, very closely um, with multiple um, agencies. I think one of the, the keys to us um, having 
active management here in the Black Hills is the amount of collaboration that we do with a whole host of folks. Um, the list is, is very long. And the genesis of that, I believe, started back in the early 2000s uh, with the establishment of the National Forest Advisory Board that we have here in the Black Hills. I believe the next panel is probably going to talk about that, but that really, really formed the foundation for collaboration. Uh, it, it provided avenue for diverse interest, to sit around the table with four service to discuss um, national forest management issues. So, and, and then bring recommendations, their thoughts, their energies um, to that and their passions. Uh, and it really helped this forest uh, move forward. The other thing that has been successful um, is, is the key to the success here is, as Jeff mentioned, uh, having a vibrant uh, forest products industry, they do the bulk of the work of active forest management uh, here on this forest. Um, without the, um, you know, our conditions of for, our, our forest conditions would be much, much worse than, than, um, um, than we could even imagine. Um, this is a very productive forest, high rates of, of reproduction, and uh, without them, um, I don't know where we'd be sitting today. Um, they're very important to accomplishing the goals that we have here on the forest. Um, when I, um, in Kel talking with Kelsey about, um, you know, innovation, what's, what really is um, innovation to us here? I really think um, there are some things that has helped this force. Um, and, and mainly it comes through the authorities that we've gotten recently in, in legislation. Healthy Forest Restoration Act um, is used frequently on this force. Um, the Good Neighbor Authority which uh, were in the beginning uh, stages of, of uh, uh, developing projects, working with the state of South Dakota to develop the master agreement. Wyoming has theirs put together. Um, the other thing that we use extensively is our existing agreements and authorities um, to accomplish work. And lastly, I think what has helped us from an innovative standpoint um, in terms of efficiency is our planning processes. Um, I'll start with planning processes first. Uh, when I first joined the Forest Service a few years back, our planning, our project areas were very small, probably around 1,000 acres, maybe 2,000 acres. And that's how we did our planning for, for, for our management activities. That has evolved over time. Um, here on this forest, uh, most recently, um, not too far in the distant past, our project areas are about 20 to 60,000 acres, which is, which is fairly large, um, which um, you, you accomplish, um, you, you capitalize on efficiencies by um, operating at that scale. But here recently, we've evolved into a much larger scale a scale that's forest wide. Our planning for projects with one NEPA document now is the entire forest. Um, the Black Hills Mountain Pine Beetle Restoration Project, um, that was a forest wide planning process. That identified high risk stands, approximately 240,000 acres of high risk stands were identified in that NEPA uh, document for potential treatment. Um, we're in the process of implementing that currently right now. The next one, the next generation, is the uh, Black Hills uh, rest Landscape Restoration Burl. Um, Black Hills um, um, Landscape Restoration Project, which is another forest-wide planning effort, um, site-specific. And that is targeting um, conditions across the forest where um, we're going to create more resilient forests, looking at our structural stages and our distribution of our structure within our forests, as well as to address um, 
um, the past conditions created by, by the mountain pine beetle, such as hazardous fuels. So I think that's, that's one place where we innovated very well on the forest. We have great planning staff, very knowledgeable um, and very good at what they do. Um, in terms of HFRA, which it had given us a tool to streamline our environmental analysis by potentially only having one action alternative. We've used that extensively, uh, probably over the last five to six years, um, which has benefited us in terms of reducing our costs and analysis and being more timely with our decisions um, to be able to get those out in the ground and address the, uh, the need that's out there. With um, um, the Good Neighbor Authority, uh, as I mentioned, we're just launching into it. I think it holds great promise. Um, working with our local counties, um, working with states uh, to increase our capacity to do work or even just maintain it because we're, all of our budgets are starting to either uh, remain stable or slightly decline. So any way that we can leverage our resources, whether it's human or financial, to um, accomplish work or maybe even get more work done, I think that's a good thing. I think that's very creative. Um, the one that I'm most familiar with is the one I'm currently working on with the state of Wyoming, um, a good neighbor project. It's really in its initial phases, but um, the uh, district is going to do the planning, marking of the boundaries of the treatment units, identify the prescriptions, and pass that inform information on to the state. The state will then develop the, the contract uh, and administer the contract. And it's really helping us treat some lands that we had difficult access to. The state has some authorities that they can, can get access to lands um, that we do not. So there's a great tool there that we can, we can continue to, to use and, and evolve as we learn. The last thing that we've used extensively, and it was mentioned yesterday by Greg, um, is that we have, have used participating agreements. We did Good Neighbor before Good Neighbor was cool, I believe, uh, through our participating agreements. Uh, we, uh, many of the ranger districts had these agreements with counties or with the states to either directly control mountain pine beetle, um, infested trees, or um, actually do uh, timber sales, uh, help with timber sales. I believe the stewardship agreements that they have with Pennington County is, is, is really uh, kind of a neat way to expand our capacities. Um, so with those participating agreements, um, it really brought in um, folks that had not really worked that closely with us before, but through that, course of time, we developed our relationships, um, how do we do business together, and, and really focused on common, common objective of restoring our forest and, and reducing our stands of mountain pine beetle. I think in the end, um, we have um, some great opportunities here uh, in the Black Hills region. We, one of the things that we really struck me yesterday as, as I was sitting in the audience is that everybody, no matter where they're from, talks about the same thing. They talk about how we collaborate together. Every speaker probably talked about how well we work together, how, how, how good that we can sit around and talk about issues and, and solve tough problems. That's what really struck me yesterday is, is how everybody here is talking about the same thing. And so everybody has a common vision working on the same end of, of the problem and trying to solve problems. So with that, I will stop and uh, turn it over back to you, Kelsey. All right, thank you to our three speakers. Now we'll be moving into the kind of dialogue and audience participation. 
questions that audience members have for our panelists? Oh, sure. Hey, good morning. This is Christine Dahl, the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, question for Jeff. Um, you were talking about um, what do we do with all this biomass and the efforts to burn it to create energy and some other things, and really we need to use the existing markets that we have. Um, it's really going to really an increasing problem, I think, particularly across the West with limited markets for low value, small diameter. Uh, wood that's coming off the national forests, which we, we want and need to remove to meet our objectives and reduce fuel loadings and things like that. But without a market for industry to go to with it, what do we do with it? So do you have any suggestions on how, what we can do to accelerate the development of new markets to deal with that? You said wood innovation grants and things, nothing's really come of that. I guess, what are the barriers and what can we do to try to accelerate some new markets? Yes, it, there's been a lot of, uh, like I mentioned, research into uh, using uh, wood biomass cellulose for uh, conversion to fuels. Um, you know, the, the processes that are out there today are very expensive um, to, to uh, gain very little fuel. Um, they have processes that work, very expensive. Uh, like any new type of industry, you know, over time, uh, that will change, but how long will that take? Um, you know, one of the issues is we have, you know, up here in the Black Hills, we have very prolific forest, so it's constantly growing. And, you know, the market for that small diameter wood, we have markets for that, but they're not very large. Um, so, we, you know, we're trying to utilize that in the best way we can. Um, you know, the here in the Black Hills and Steve or Craig or somebody, you know, we talk about, you know, slash piles. I mean, we've got, what's the 20,000 slash piles somewhere in that range here on the hills. So that, that yeah, th tens of thousands of piles of tops of trees and, you know, the current process is to burn them, you know, because we don't have a market for the, that type of product. Um, you know, the industry is working on that through ways to, um, take timber subject to agreement where we have a timber sale and you know the small diameter wood you know the the contractor can can work out an agreement with the forest service to take some of that small wood and and utilize it you know that along with with possibly changing utilization standards you know we look at at ways to okay maybe we take some of that wood now that is maybe above pre-commercial thinning size that we're that's stocking for the next generation of trees. Maybe we take some of that now um, so we don't have a problem later on. And, you know, the, the current industry, you know, we have companies here that, that can make investments in newer technologies to utilize that wood. And, but it's, we got this huge amount of the biomass versus you know, this smaller size of, of bigger trees that we can sell as lumber. So it, it is a big problem. And, and, you know, currently, you know, the amount of POL, you know, term, first service term from once upon a time ago, uh, post and other logs, what's that mean? Uh, but, you know, we have a market for fence posts and those types of things, but they need good wood too, just like the sawmill needs good, good logs to make good lumber. Um, and, and we're for the most part getting, you know, the volumes that, you know, the local companies can go out and market those products. So, you know, there has to be continued dialogue, you know, looking into how can we utilize that type of product and chip it up? Can we use it for fuel? Yes. Um, we run into a lot of regulations that we have to deal with. Um, when you're talking about, uh, code generation and, you know, uh, Nyman Enterprises looked at it. We've looked at it. Um, you know, we can we can take that biomass and burn it and create energy. And one of the problems we have is that it costs X amount to do that. And when we go to the power company, 
to say, okay, we have this XX power. We want to sell back to you. You know, what will you give us for it? Well, they'll give you about half of what it costs to do. Um, so there has to be some sort of subsidy there or mandate, which there is in certain parts of the country. In Colorado, we've got a, a plant down there that, that is a code gen facility. They burn in biomass, but they have a very good agreement with the power company that the, you know they can be profitable at it. But it takes a huge investment to do that uh, initially. So, you know, there's there's lots of these issues out there that we continually have to have dialogue on, you know, what's the answer? Uh, right now, we don't have a real good answer. Other questions? Just kind of a follow up on that are there changes to the our state laws or federal laws or potential tax incentives or what could be done to incentivize the use of that slash and that small diameter stuff once again I, I, you know i think it goes back to um you know selling power back to the grid and you know i don't know what the currently what the you know the mandates or state laws are within south dakota for you know our big producers, Black Hills Power, and you know, I know they're you know they're most of the uh, power companies and co-ops throughout the nation are uh, moving to green energy. Uh, wind has been the big one here in in our area, Wyoming, Colorado. Um, you know there has been incentives for companies to build windmills and wind farms, and to make the initial investment to do that. And you know what the arrangements are for selling power back to the power companies, and and what their mandates are uh, as far as how much power and where it comes from. I don't know if there there is one uh, within South Dakota with the power companies if they are mandated to create ten you know ten percent of their power from green energy. I don't know that. That's maybe a question for someone else. Um, Hunter Roberts with Governor Dugard's office. The state of South Dakota has a 10 per, or a 10 percent renewable energy objective, so a goal for 10 percent renewables. That does not include hydropower, which I mean is about 40 percent of our power production. Um, the big thing that's that's holding back uh, biomass, in my opinion, in South Dakota is cost. I mean, bringing that stuff out of the forest, you use a lot of diesel and labor to do that, and that's expensive um, for not as much heating value as what you'd have with, with normal wood or solid wood. Um, so that, that creates a challenge. At the same time, um, uh, we have hydro that is nice and cheap and available and renewable that um, Black Hills Power uses some of. They have a lot of mine mouth coal plants that are producing power. Um, those things are built they're producing today. So it's a, it's like anything when you need to buy new, it costs more. So uh, that's a, that's a pretty big hurdle to compete with when you look at new power generation. So if we were to, to have a renewable energy objective or a, a, a renewable energy mandate, I suspect that Black Hills Corp and, and many of the other utilities would go with wind because it's cheaper now. I mean, the costs have come down tremendously with wind. Um, there are some, some benefits of biomass as far as um, not being or much more consistent base load type power. But um, that's things that we consider all the time. The legislature's taken a look at it a few different times. And it's just uh, renewable energy mandate just doesn't work for South Dakota. Um, you know, the irony of, of this discussion is our lumber industry are huge power consumers too. So, I mean, when utility companies buy new power, usually it costs more and rates go up. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there. Um, I know you guys are, and we appreciate that, are always looking for, for cheaper energy and to keep those costs down. Um, if you mandate a company to buy something more expensive, prices are going to go up. Just 
just kind of going along the same lines. Uh, I'm curious to know about how the forest here is using stewardship contracting and, and incentive incentives built into that. What, what are the economics of building into stewardship contracting opportunities to, to use the biomasses? I'm looking at Steve or Jeff or any one of you that want to take a stab at that. I'm just curious to know, does it, does it play out enough to you? Are there ways that the agency could be playing a role to help cover some of those costs to make biomass potentially more economically feasible going forward and using stewardship contracting as a tool for that. I'll start. I'll start that discussion. Um, yeah, we, you know, stewardship contracting is, is relatively new uh, within the Forest Service and, and we've been doing it here in the Black Hills. Um, Mark's new to the Hills, so I was going to ask Craig that Steve probably knows. Um, so you know we've got you know stewardship contracting is, is a good way for the Forest Service to achieve certain goals that they can't achieve in a single contract and a logging contract. You know you can go in and and logging will be a component of stewardship contracting, and there also be components of of uh, changing the landscape or get to a desired condition. Would it be mastication, you know, removal of, of aspen or, re, you know, replacement of aspen? You know, there's lots of, of uh, TSI work, pre-commercial thinning, that Forest Service has to pay the contractor to do that work. Stewardship's a way to say, okay, we got to pay them to do this work, but we also get some funds from, you know, the, the logs that come off that. So it's changing the dynamics of the companies or the industry um, with those type of contracts that the traditional uh, timber contract buyers you know, have had to look at, well, how does stewardship play into our sawmill? All we want is saw, is saw logs. Okay, but, but how, do we, how can we maximize the amount of saw logs coming into our mill? Um, one of those ways is you know, we need to look at, can we as a company you know, bid on stewardship? where we're going to get some of those logs, maybe we'll subcontract this other work to another company, maybe we'll do it ourselves. So th this is all playing out now here in the Black Hills. Uh, in Colorado, they've had some very large stewardship contracts. Uh, some have, have not gone very well for one reason or another. I think they're still, Forest Service is learning, you know, how do we apply these contracts? What type of contracts are we going to put out there? But it does help in in getting the job done and you know how that's going to play out in the future um, i guess i don't know but you know there the forest service is trying to get more biomass which is obviously needed here in the black hills and one of the reasons that we we're in the situation we are today where we're so prolific in growing trees or ponderosa pine is 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 that 30 40 years ago we had an outlet for all that small diameter wood in, in pulp. Uh, we had a, a paper plant in Wisconsin that took everything we could send them. And you know, our company at one time, 30, 40 years ago, you know, we had 300 loggers in the woods. We had a sawmill. We were sending pulp wood, all that small diameter wood, anything we didn't use, it got loaded on a rail car and shipped to Wisconsin. And we could make that work. All of a sudden, the paper mill says, we're not going to buy any more wood from you guys. Now we're like, well, what are we going to do with all this wood? Well, we can't go out and buy that wood anymore. You know, we have markets for for POL, but it's not as big as that was. So you know, just like now, you know, we're shipping chips. We're utilizing chips here in the Black Hills to a certain extent, but a lot of them get exported to the West Coast. And, and the, you know, the factors out there that affect the economics of doing that, whether it be rail rates or, you know, the, the amount of chips that are being exported overseas, and you know, those all come into play. And you know, how do we utilize that biomass? In the recent election, there was quite a bit of discussion around you know companies moving operations overseas, and how do we reestablish industry here in the states? And you brought up the pulp mill. I was curious to know if there were, if there was a because of the globalized nature of that market, is are the, is that why they were not able to 
take your logs anymore? And, and how much does the globalized nature of the commodities market around timber affect you all here locally in general? Yeah, and, and you know, as, as Wheeler is a secondary manufacturer, so, you know, we're not buying uh, currently timber contracts and we're not producing lumber. We buy lumber from other mills. And, you know, the, the global economy has changed and it has affected the timber industry dramatically. You know, we've got the softwood lumber agreement that's in flux right now. The exchange rates between Canada and the U.S. is a huge factor in the economics of our business, uh, just like pulp and paper. I mean, those, you know, the, the paper mills have changed the dynamics of what they produce based on what's being done globally and where the fiber market is. Um, you know, we look at, you know, utilizing biomass here and, you know, we've got uh, um, spearfish products, forest products, they build a pellet mill to help more utilize sawdust and chips coming out of their mill you know, to develop a market um, to do that. And they've been successful with that. Um, you know, in the south, southeast, you know, they've got huge pellet mills down there. They're shipping that product to Europe. Um, you know, here it's more localized. You know, we can't compete with that sort of thing. Um, you know, once again, the exchange rate on the dollar is big. Uh, as far as product or lumber coming into the United States uh, over the years when you know, we've had market ups and downs and, and, you know, the exchange rate is a big factor in that. So, you know, even though we're in this little isolated pocket of a million acres of forest, you know, those types of global issues affect us dramatically. So, so if I could respond um, to, to those questions, and, and I, I think I heard part of it was, was on exporting logs. Right. So, so, so just qu quickly, the, 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 in the national forest, you, you, you cannot export logs from the national forest. And almost all the timber in South Dakota is from the national forest. So there just aren't opportunities to, to export logs from here. Plus, we're, we're, we're a long ways from the coast. But, but the other thing I wanted to, to um, talk about was stewardship contracts and your questions on stewardship contracts. And, it, and it's interesting that, you know, diff different places around the country um, utilize stewardship contracts more or le less than others. And I, I say some of the concerns I hear from purchasers in the Black Hills about stewardship contracts, well, one, one is the, the proposals. You, you have to submit a proposal rather than just a bid. And, and those are very lengthy and very time consuming and purchasers don't, don't, don't have the time to, uh, to, to do that. And, and so they, they push back. Um, there, there's also an evaluation process, which is much different than just opening a bid and, and looking at a number and deciding the high bidder. Um, there, um, there, there's in some ways there's less flexibility in stewardship contracts on having uh, optional material in the contracts. And um, we, we run into some problems with that. Um, and like Jeff said, ma mandatory removal uh, gets to be a, a heck of a problem if you don't have a market for it. And so you, you, you really can't force those things. Um, and then, then there's just uncertainties with, with different parts of the contract. Uh, you know, so some of the things that are pretty routine in a timber sale contract are not routine in a, a stewardship contract, like um, uh, additional time if, if your logger goes off to fight fires for two or four weeks during the middle of the summer. So there, there, there's just some issues there. Um, these, these are being discussed uh, at, at the Federal Timber Purchasers Committee, uh, which is a national group. And uh, I, I'd say very, constructive discussions with some of the, the, the folks from the Forest Services Washington office, but, but that's the, those are the things I hear back from purchasers in the Black Hills about stewardship contracts. So let me make just a couple comments about stewardship, because I, I think a lot of folks in the room, and I'm sure Tom is aware of this, but there's two different types. There's an integrated resource contract, which 
has a lot more than timber involved. It can involve all kinds of other resource management work. And, and I think that's the type of contract that Jeff was referring to and that Tom was referring to. There's also an integrated resource timber contract. Um, and the process for that is very different. It isn't um, a proposal. It's essentially a bid, just like you'd submit in a regular timber sale contract. Uh, it's evaluated based on that dollar amount rather than evaluating other factors. Um, and it, what it does is it generates revenue that comes completely back to the forest to be able to get other work done. Uh, you can include service work in those contracts, but you don't have to. It can be pr principally a timber harvest and perhaps some road work. And then all the other work that you want to have done can be subcontract, not subcontract, but contracted to different individuals who focus on that type of work. Um, and you use your retained receipts. And the other benefit is, unlike KV funds, it can be spent outside the sale area boundary. So it has a much broader application on how we can use it. Uh, it's not going to solve our problem on all of our small diameter wood, but it could be a piece of the puzzle in helping us generate additional revenue to help be able to treat that uh, and pay somebody for that work. Now, developing a market's obviously the, the better option, uh, and I think that's something we'll all continue to work towards and look for opportunities. Nancy Troutman, Pennington County. Um, we do have a stewardship agreement, and I think the thing that was really um, something we had to seriously consider was the length of time. Our stewardship agreement lasts over 10 years. And I guess I'm curious, Mark, are they all going to be that way? I mean, you, your commitment of time, in my understanding, is important to cons if you're looking forward for a, a, a lumber company to commit that kind of time might be pretty difficult. Yeah, one of the one of the values in having a longer time frame is it allows you to do work over a longer period of time. But the drawback is you're committing yourself to a longer period of time. So, um, with a timber contract and with our KV funds, we have a limited time in which we can spend those dollars. Uh, by extending that time out, it allows us to do some other work uh, on that forested stand that we might not be able to do in a five-year time frame. It's just an interesting observation to me that the points Mike made yesterday about leadership and human dynamics in these things is within the Forest Service, there's pushback because it's something new. And within the industry, Jeff just alluded to that there's producers that their niche is saw logs. Other producers' niche is POL. Um, and I think it comes back to human nature and asking those questions of how to get the total land management job done. And um, I think within that, within this discussion, there's tools available to do that and to make it better. The more and more we do it, the better and better we'll get. There's, um, that's point number one. Point number two on the biomass thing is, um, the forest, certain the within the Black Hills, all the entities put, put together about thirty thousand acres of harvest a year. That makes about three thousand piles a year. And I hope we look at that energy question not just from an energy perspective. And I appreciate what the economics is tell is telling us, or I don't appreciate it, I suppose. But um, if we can look at the total land management need and the resource stewardship need we can look at the energy side of it and the economics of it and we can also look at the economics of how to treat the land and um, producers put money on the table and they make deposits for brush disposal roughly 50 percent of that goes to the washington office to support upper level agency activities Knuts and vandenberg funds for sale area improvement roughly 40 percent as i recall the numbers um, goes for overhead and through stewardship arrangements, perhaps it all that overhead remains on the national forest to do more land management things. So I hope we can look at the total land management need um, that encompasses the economics of energy production. Okay, I'll follow up on that and just ask this question of 
Forest Service, I guess, when you when you look at putting together a or look at a stewardship contract or or a GNA um, opportunity. And I realize it may be too subjective to look at, but uh, to what extent are you able to look at avoided costs of if you implement that contract and and look at uh, well, okay, if we didn't do this management option and a fire goes through there and the water quality impacts and and firefighting costs and and all of those other elements does does the forest service have a way to uh put that into its calculation i guess is the question and uh, and i i look at that just from uh and i've mentioned this before at at the two previous at both previous workshops I look at Colorado, I look at the upper South Platte basin and um, it's we've had some devastating wildfires in there in areas that I uh, grew up in uh, playing in and but because the fire went through there so hot that even now 20 years later it's a dead zone. Um, and and we still have water quality impacts on Metro Denver drinking water supply uh, when you get a good rain through there and it just brings down uh, all that dead earth into our water supply. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way to calculate the cost of all of that into uh, these management activities. So I'll take an initial crack at that, and, and I'm sure there's others that can respond too, but um, we certainly look at all of those factors when we do our environmental analysis and look at projects, and we look at those trade-offs and what um, those long-term consequences are of those things. From a budgetary standpoint, we, we don't really have a mechanism other than the appropriations process and how those things are considered in that appropriations process. So, but I know in, in Colorado, for example, there has been a lot of work with uh, water boards and other entities, local governments, to help fund some of that kind of work. Um, and that may be a, a potential opportunity. The other thing, again, going back to stewardship, is you're generating those retained receipts that can be used to address some of those other things and gives us some additional funding to be able to pay for that um, because of those retained receipts. So. It, it, there, it's probably a mix of a whole bunch of different things, um, but it is a huge cost to do what you're talking about, and, and uh, we're going to need to figure out creative ways to come up with additional funding to do that. So I'll just pile on to Mark's uh, answer there a little bit. Um, in the environmental analysis process, theoretically, we calculate that in in terms of long-term trade-offs, and we don't have good metrics to describe that. There are folks who are working on the cost of uh, um, ecosystem services and putting some dollar value on some of that. Um, and uh, I think there's good work to be done there in the future. I would say the, the fastest way I know to start an argument is to ask two economists the same question. So I don't have a lot of hope with ecosystem services dollar amounts, but I do have hope in terms of identifying that in our environmental analysis. Um, another example I'd offer to consider, so we've done the analysis, that's more rationale to treat a landscape. Got it. So the, the, another grain of sand in the bucket of we better do something now. So that bucket is getting really full. We still have the financial capacity limitations. Um, the city of Flagstaff, after a significant fire that burned into town um, six years ago or so, voted in and passed a, uh, a, a bond levy on themselves to finance restoration work on National Forest System lands outside town. 
So there the public voted with their wallet to get the work done. That's, that's a, one example. Ben Woodkey with Black Hills Forest Resource Association. Uh, Steve, you, you talked a lot about how the Black Hills National Forest has evolved through the NEPA process, and, and that, that's very important with approximately half of the cost of any forestry project tied up in, in NEPA and, and the expenses to, to get that get that analysis done. Um, you discussed the Mountain Pine Beetle Response Project and, and looking at the forest-wide scale and authorizing treatment on 240,000 acres. Uh, and I know that about half of that was actually authorized for commercial treatment. And to date, we've treated about 25,000 acres out of that record of decision that was signed four years ago. I think the forest plans to get about 60,000 total acres out of that decision. What is the Forest Service doing to, to evolve further in the NEPA process to, to get the most bang for our buck and, and to maximize the acres treated under each decision? Just kind of thinking about that, Ben, um, the Mountain Pine Beetle Response Project um, was um, really kind of the first effort out the door uh, in terms of looking at a, a forest-wide NEPA project. We've learned a lot um, with the um, landscape resiliency project that we're, we're currently working on right now. We're going back and talking with the implementers at the district, trying to glean from them what worked and what didn't work. So we're, we're trying to be learners as we go um, and not just charge out the door, not learning from our past uh, past efforts. So I think that's going to help us in the, in the next round. Um, in terms of efficiencies and maximizing uh, uh, projects out of decisions or acres treated out of decision, I think the quality of information is always is always good. The, the better information that you have up front uh, when you make the decision, um, that's always good because then it prevents redos or mistakes or whatever you, you have to clean up there in terms of the implementation side. I think our information um, databases are, are much more improved than they were five to 10 years ago. So that's going to help us. Um, and I think what we're trying to do is, is look out into the future. Um, what if we can't get back to this area for another five to 10 years or, or 12 years? Um, what can we do? How can we be more robust in our decisions um, in terms of our, our purpose and need when we develop our purpose and need? Instead of being so narrow, can we be a little bit more broader? Um, can we? Can we design some flexibility in our decisions to allow for adaption? Um, so, um, looking back in history a little bit, um, you know, with past decisions that I made uh, on smaller landscapes, twenty to sixty thousand acres, where you maximize those planning dollars is where you have a flexible decision. Uh, where you find conditions like X, then I will do this. Um, even though it may have not been identified up there, but if you set that up in your decision to allow some for some adaption because the environment changes and information changes, I think that that will that will help. And I think I've, we've seen that in some of our recent decisions. And I think the, the landscape resiliency project is going to kind of look at that too. So no doubt um, our costs. Um, keep going up like everybody else. Um, and our pot has pretty much stayed the same too. And so we got to be, be efficient and, and um, look at ways that we can capitalize on that investment as much as possible. One of the things, um, just going back to the Good Neighbor Project that we're working with the state of Wyoming, that decision was made back in 2000, I think six or seven someplace in there. And those acres were identified to treat, but we really didn't have a good way to move the logs off, off the forest. 
somebody came in and said, hey, I built a road on private land that came right by where we needed access. And so there was an opportunity that came to us um, that um, was very fortunate and very fortunate we had the good neighbor authority. So I think we, we sometimes we make decisions, I'm guilty of this, we make decisions in three, four years we implement and then we go on to the next thing. But we still have some stuff in our previous decisions that may be consistent with um, the forest plan, laws, policies, and regulation that we still can go back and glean probably some additional treatments out of our, our past decisions. So that's a long-winded answer there, Ben. Paul Pearson, I work for Nyman uh, here in Spearfish. Um, a lot of these discussions yesterday afternoon with with uh, culture and, um, and and then this panel here with uh, active management and innovative markets uh, just have me thinking, um, Steve. With there's a I think there is a, a reality um, on on the federal side um, that your your pot is staying the same. You know costs are going up. And there's there's kind of this un, un, unspoken rule of, you know, there's a fear if you overachieve, um, then you're going to be expected to do to do more with less next time. And on the industry side, it's it's completely the opposite. We're we're constantly pushed to overachieve, and then we're rewarded for for doing that. And I just wonder if there's any way, uh, you know, WGA and 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 this this group can talk, and, and maybe make some some changes there and. Just want to get your feeling on that, Steve, and anybody else in the room. Overachievers. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I um, we got to be cognizant, you know, from our end too. Um, efficiencies uh, you know overachieving is good um, we do help out our neighbors um, looking at uh, this past year we overachieved here on this forest to help out additional forests that were in the region uh, you know similarly we do that here on on the forest too if, if a district has a particular issue with with the project that they're working on another district will step up to the table and, and help them out um, the thing about overachieving way too much you kind of start running past your headlights really quick so um, there's kind of that balance there I agree with you you know in ter terms of is there some way to to recognize you know the overachievement and so forth um, I don't know if anybody else in, in the forest has, or service has anything to, to say about that, but, um, you know, we're funded to put so many widgets out. That's what we're funded to do. So Congress sets out to do, it's, uh, gives us money, this is how many widgets you're supposed to produce, and that's what we usually do um, on a consistent basis, and we try to do that as efficiently as possible using the resources that we got. Um, so it's kind of a double-edged sword sometimes. Yeah, go ahead, pile on, Alan. <laughs> here, here. So uh, duly noted, and as we're working on the finish the 16 and preparing for the fiscal year 17 and 18 budget, what we've had conversations about it in the Washington office is to provide financial stability to the regions and the forests. So we don't get in that trap. And I would also say that trap you described is urban legend in the minds of people in the field. I had that for a while. And then I realized they didn't take my birthday away. I'm going to keep after it. So we have a cultural shift to make in terms of um, 
suppressing and stamping out that urban legend. And one way we can act on that is to um, provide that stability to units in the long term. And that's what we're trying to do in 17 and 18 and beyond. So maybe you could help us stamp out the urban legend. Um, Tom Troxell, um, and I think Dave Olala is getting off way too easy here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, D Dave, a, a comment and a, and a question. One is, I, I liked your comment about you know, looking ahead, thinking ahead of, on what we expect the public lands to look like and, and to do. And, and I, I would relate that back to forest plans. And I've often thought that the desired conditions part of forest plans are the most important and most underutilized part of forest plans. And, and so I, I just second what you said. And, and I, I would like to see that applied more to, to the forest planning process. But th then I've got a question for you. And, and, and you were talking about the plows and no-till and, and you kept talking about a systems approach. I, I don't know what that is. Can, can you explain what you mean by a systems approach to all of that? Well, yeah. And, and so the model would be an ecosystem and everything's interrelated and, and that's what you run into. Uh, certainly the, the treatments that you put in uh, while they improve one thing may harm another and uh, it's a lot of those are unpredictable but they can be observed and and um, improved or fit to uh, uh, help uh, support the resilience that we're after and, and that's what it certainly comes down to and it's it's not it's by none of that is by any means a figured out science it's always going to be dynamic and we have to learn and improve on that and the forests and rangelands will respond to those systems much easier more easily because they're all interrelated and and that's uh, obviously i'm not from the forest world i'm from the range world and i i know that it all starts with the soil and and then the water that's uh, afforded that soil in that climate area is going to predict what can occur there and so we have some things some tools to us uh, in the range world that we can predict our forage production by looking back at the history of the rainfall the past two years and be relatively accurate on some of that and and so in that you know moving forward as good managers of these natural resources i think we continue to need to be a student of our and and practice which is um the best term i can think of uh, of to adapt and respond but to look ahead and plan and certainly uh i would suspect most of us would agree that uh, the issues that we face now aren't going to necessarily go away and that we uh, need to educate and we need to get better at managing those issues as they occur um, for the long-term sustainability of these resources and um, does that answer your question pretty good or yeah <laughs> Well, I've certainly found that even in, in my applications, oh, so for example, you know, the, the thought was, well, if you leave rangelands ungrazed and you rest them, that that's a great thing. Well, it is for a year maybe, but uh, truly the, the rangeland has to operate under a grazing animal. That's how it evolved and it needs manure. And who uses the manure? Well, the microbes and the dung beetles pull that into the soil so the soil can function. And if you start messing with any of those things in that system, you're going to uh, interrupt all that process. And, and, and I, it's, it's very apparent that the folks in the Forest Service get that too. Do they know all that? No, neither do we in the range world. It's, it's, it's a learning um, study, you know, that'll go far past our lives. But if we understand and accept that as part of our philosophy, that we, everything that we apply or fix 
is going to positively impact part of that system and could potentially negatively impact the other part, we need to consider those things. And that's what the assessments do as well. So. Hey, Dave, Craig Bob Zine from Custer. I want to show you a little love too. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I think you, all, you got on to actually start answering my question. And, uh, and that is the uh, use of management tools such as sheep, uh, case in point. Of seeing areas that uh, used to be historically grazed by sheep, you know, in, intensively a day or two, and they move on, and uh, then seeing those areas have basically no management and uh, and invasives just taking over and watching those systems change over the years. Could you give us a a brief on the status of saying using uh, sheep as opposed to using herbicides and invasives management? Sure, um, and. You know, we're, we're well aware of some of those issues of disease uh, transmission from domestic livestock to wildlife, and we got to be cognizant of that. And, and, but it, it is part of our tools in our toolbox, and I don't think we should take that out. Uh, for example, you know, the discussion yesterday was about understory fuel load. Well, you can have a better prescribed fire if you run some livestock through there first. They don't have to be there very long three, four days and you knock that down, you can get a better fire out of that. You know, is that being considered? Likewise, uh, uh, you know, where uh, biological control can be used, whether it's insects or livestock, uh, is there's opportunity. We have so many um, pieces of technology that we can use separately or together that can uh, serve those same goals. Uh, one thing that kind of struck me, and I'm not against prescribed burning, but you remember I come from rangeland, and and so yes, part of our communities and relationships within our communities surround our volunteer fire departments and and suppressing fire. Um, you know, some of the applications I've seen by government agencies in prescribed burnings. Uh, one uh, person agent uh, told me that uh, to do a prescribed burn on one allotment and i don't know how many acres it was turned out to be about 75 dollars an acre well to me from a sheep herder point of view is i'd be happy if you paid me 75 dollars an acre to to take down your buck brush for you i can do that and so is is that our best served tool there and uh, relationships, collaborations, communications. Uh, I think uh, knowing that those things exist and, and planning, you're not going to say, well, I, I'm going to graze this forest and I'm going to just call up a sheep herder and he's going to come. You know, those all need to be developed years in advance and so you can have that tool readily available for you. I, I guess I really like where some of, some of what we're talking about now and, and in some ways it kind of goes seems to me it's bringing us full circle back to some of the things we talked about yesterday you know Dave's describing you know a, a, the reality of, of adaptive management or trying things is that you know you you try something to try to achieve the kind of goals that that you were talking about the desired future conditions and most of the time it when we try a practice, it will achieve some of the things we set out to do, but sometimes it brings up things that we, we just didn't anticipate. You know, you can study something to death, but until you try, you finally try something, you never know for sure how it's going to, how it's going to turn out. And I think that's something that we, we struggle with, with the NEPA process. And I guess a, a question maybe out of all this is, We've got people, we've got some innovative people that, have, that are, that are, you know, that are, that want to try things that, that can, that they have to try on public lands. I mean, we can do some, some things on private lands, but sometimes we want to, we want to take this thing to the next level to managing on, on, on our public lands. How can we be, how can we create an opportunity to be more adaptive, to try new things, you know, pull our, you know, pull the innovators in, in the private sector into managing these public lands and make it okay for things to not necessarily come out the way we hope that they would. 
You know, I mean, we can try things on experimentally on a scale, realizing that we don't know for sure where it's going to go until we try using, you know, using livestock to, to create a situation or using fire to create a situation or using mechanical means to, to try to create future conditions. And in learning from, from this step as we go to the next step. Now, it's kind of a long question. I don't know if, if it, hopefully it made some sense. I like innovation. I like people that come into my office that have creative ideas. Um, I think it's really neat when producers, um, the public, uh, come in and sit down and, and talk what they, uh, whatever it may be, whatever kind of idea that they may have. Uh, it's, it's really fun to work with those people. And, and in some cases, we may have a decision that would allow something like that. Um, you know, on our rangelands right now, here on the forest, we uh, have very recent NEPA decisions, probably in the last five to six years, probably most of them got done, and, and they do have adaptive principles in, in those decisions. So if, if a uh, permittee or somebody um, that wants to work come in and look at um, how you treat noxious weeds uh, or different changes in grazing strategies or something like that, it may be, it may be already covered by NEPA or it may just take a little bit of, of additional analysis to allow that activity to occur. So um, what I've kind of seen in my career with NEPA decisions are becoming more, um, more adaptable. There's longer shelf lives. There's, there you're thinking about that investment that you're putting in planning. You want to make sure when you put that dollar in, that dollar is going to last. That it's going to run out for a long time. You don't want um, a very, uh, very static decision. Um, so, I, I do encourage people, people I work with closely, a lot of the permittees. If you got an idea, come in, please, because. Um, I don't have the corner on ideas, no, not at all, um, you know, and uh, having those people come in, I learn a lot, um, my staff learns a lot, they um, develop that relationship and, and things kind of go from there. So uh, definitely um, we, we have our doors open. touch a little bit on that. But I'll tell you, one uh, government agency, and I like the way they handle their bag of money and how they apply it to conservation is the NRCS. So I might put Tate on the spot a little bit there. But what I've seen them do is uh, every state gets a bag of money and uh, they've got some certain goals and, and programs that they're, they're going to use with private landowners to uh, encourage and practice conservation every state tends to be different in how they use and emphasize and, and practice that. But that again, fits their state and local needs. And so Tate, can you touch any more on, on that and how that works? And Well, working with the, <clears throat> working with the NRCS, we're kind of lucky because we do most of our work on private lands. So we are not nearly as, handcuffed with the NEPA processes, working on public lands. Um, you know, most of our, our funding decisions are based on local resource concerns or local, local groups that are coming up with the resource concerns that they would like to address. So we have a lot of local input that, you know, I think that gives us the flexibility that some of these other agencies do not have. And, you know, we're lucky, we're lucky to have that option, you know, those options. So I think, I think some of that model should be looked at a little more. Uh, and certainly there's restrictions that go to that, but it certainly addresses local needs much better. Yeah, I hate to say this, but we're already over time on this panel. You guys are way too energetic for a, for a Friday morning. Um, Great job, you guys, and um, I can I, I'll let you do that, and then, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, great job to our speakers. Actually, can we have a round of applause for them? All right, thank you so much. And I believe we might be at a break.